Okay, guys, what we've got here is a, is a HRC, or high rupturing capacity, or a HBC, high breaking capacity uh, fuse. Now, this one here is a BS88, um, just in a, a standard domestic uh, 100 amp fuse holder, similar to what you get on the incoming supply of a, uh, of a domestic premises. This is an 80 amp fuse. So the, whole, the, the holder can take 100 amps. This fuse itself is only an 80 amp fuse. If we look inside, you can see the ceramic wall. Yeah, you look about eight millimeters thick of, of hardened ceramic um, designed to contain the, the, uh, the break-in under short circuit conditions. I believe from memory, this one here could take uh, about 80,000 amps at 415 volts looking a bit closer inside here you can see the elements so these carry the all, all current that goes through the fuse goes through these two elements and if we look real careful just there and up underneath there you can see the m point that's m for mary that's a point where um, they put a bit of low temperature tin low melting temperature tin so that as the current flows through there that under overload conditions that tin will heat up that'll melt and will melt that piece of the bar just there and that one just there they'll melt out thereby stopping the current flow okay if we look at it at a different angle you can see that it areas of low cross-sectional area particularly here, which is, it's actually already broken, but low cross-sectional area. And again, on the bottom there, the lower the cross-sectional area, the higher the current flow is going to be, okay? High current flow means it's most likely to break in these points here. And there's also some down each end, not just the ones in the middle. So under short circuit conditions, so a short circuit is a uh, a fault of negligible impedance or zero impedance between line and neutral or between line conductors and it's going to result in a massive uh, current flow so what happens is here each one of these little lower cross-sectional areas melts and uh, forms an arc in this section here all around these elements it's not uh, empty there is silica gel or silica sand I should say not gel what happens is when these breaks these areas break this sand falls between them the fumes from the uh, silver element along with the heat from the arc forms this sand into a into a form of glass what then happens is glass is an insulator, so it forms an insulator barrier. So at each break, you get a little bit of insulation, which stops the current flow from flowing, thereby containing a high, you know, 80,000 amps, or within a relatively small container. Okay, what we're looking at here is a, a just a standard circuit breaker. It's a B32 Crabtree breaker, so it's a B curve capable of carrying 32 amps this this type here connects into a, a crabtree board with a bus bar so it's got a slightly different line connector here but other than that they're all the same so your outgoings here and that's your incoming we look inside you can see the switch at the top here that's what you normally see in the switchboard is that bit there you can see the spring mechanism in here We've got a bimetallic strip, a solenoid, and an arc chute. So if we switch this on, you can see the mechanism starts to come down. So we're starting to set the spring. At the same time as that's coming down, you can see this contact here is coming across and is going to make contact with this edge over here. Okay, and it locks in. The way these are wired, this is the outgoing terminal. You can see that's connected to this bimetallic strip. That bimetallic strip at the back there by braided copper cable, uh, copper wire or copper uh, rope 
is connected to the incoming supply through the solenoid. So all current flow through this breaker is going to go through this bimetallic strip. Okay. Anytime we get current flow, we are going to get heat buildup. And so a bimetallic strip is going to heat up. Now this strip is two different types of metal bonded together. As metal heats up, it expands. It's going to expand at a different rate. Okay, so as the metal expands, one side expands quicker than the other, and we start to get a bend in. Okay, and so it starts to move that way like that. You see, attached to the bus uh, to the uh, bimetallic strip, we've got a little hook. That little hook is going to come across, and it's going to hit this little plastic. A bit hard to see, but this little plastic pressure plate just here. So as that comes across. It catches that pressure plate, if I can get it to catch, brings it across and switches it off. If you're, uh, this biometallic strip operates under overload conditions. So an overload is where the circuit is, is electrically safe, it is electrically healthy, but people have just plugged too much stuff in. We're trying to get too much out of our circuit. So I reset that again. Biometallic strip comes across, heats it up, and switches it off. Now, if you were to go to this circuit breaker and try turning it back on straight away, you can see it doesn't work. Okay. Allow the biometallic strip time to cool down, and we switch back on. Okay. Fault cleared. You've unplugged a few stuff, uh, a bit of the stuff, and we're good to go. Okay. So that's your overload protection. The other thing that a circuit breaker can protect against is uh, is called a, a short circuit or an earth fault. It's called an overcurrent fault. Okay, and that's taken care of by this solenoid in the middle here. So I've got I've taken a solenoid out of another circuit breaker, so you can see a little bit more. As the current comes through, as it reaches a set uh, a set level, and you can see a pin comes out. If I take this apart a little bit more, you've got a plastic or ceramic former, just to keep it all in line. There's a brass pin and a return spring. But the bit that we're most interested in, or I'm most interested in, is this brass or this metal slug here. It's just a big piece of metal that what happens is as the current flows through the coil, we get a buildup of magnetic forces, which then draws the magnetic slug, uh, the metal slug in. As the metal slug pulls in, it pushes the pin out. So if I put that back in there, you can see as a pin goes, as a, as a slug goes in, the pin comes out. Okay. That pin is the same as that one there. It's a slightly different construction. It's a different brand, but you can see this pin here. Okay. As the magnetic forces build up, it pulls it in and switches it off. So again, this brand here is again slightly different, so it's got a hook on the back here as well, so it catches the uh, the bar here as well. So it, it takes care of it from both sides. And then open. Anytime we switch off something under load, you are going to get an arc. So as this as this contact here opens, you are going to start getting an arc. That arc, if not extinguished, is going to cause this to go bang in a bad way. So what happens is we've got this arc shoot down here. Okay, so your arc shoots this bit here, comes down, your arc shoots down. The electrons are all negatively charged, so they try to get away from each other and your arc gets shot down this chute and into an arc splitter, okay? Just lots of little row, little uh, plates, so the, the, the arc hits it and then it gets extinguished. Can't keep itself going and gets extinguished. I 
purpose and, and just to say a why you should never turn off a, uh, a main switch under load there is a two pole main switch that I've opened up so if we operate the main switch you can see it's just a set of contacts that open and close now this can take this switch here can take a hundred amps okay the main difference between it that I'm looking at at this point is this arc chute. If an arc forms in your circuit breaker, it goes to the arc chute. If an arc forms in your main switch, there's nothing to put it out. So you should always download your board before turning off the main switch. Okay, here I've got an RCD, 30 milliamp RCD taken out of a domestic board. It's just a double, a double pole switch. Okay, got your test button there. Not much to look at, so we'll get rid of that and put that one in. Okay, a fair bit of uh, stuff goes on in one of these. So in here, you've got your switch mechanism, your your um, sort of your spring, your mousetrap mechanism. A bit of electronics here. You've got your incoming line, so it goes through. You've got your neutral at the back there, a bit harder to see, but you can bring it out there, it's your neutral. And this is your toroidal transformer. So if I set that, you'll have seen a set of contacts go, go along through this arc chute here, okay? So obviously if it's got an arc chute, it can isolate uh, circuits under load, which you'd hope under as an RCD. So the way this works is, as we've got current flow through this cable here, or through, through an electric cable, we get a magnetic field. So we've got magnetic field in one direction through this cable, the opposite direction through this cable, and so they're going to cancel each other out, and this toroidal transformer here, just a round transformer, is going to pick up no difference in magnetic field. Okay, so it's going to sit there quite happily. If we get a fault that takes some of the current from the neutral and sends it down through the earth conductor. We're going to pick up a difference in magnetic field in our toroidal transformer. We're just going to send, the, send it up to our electronics up here and through to our sensing coil, our, our, our little solenoid up here. If you look here, you can see this little metal plate. Push that. So what happens? As the, as the coil uh, magnetizes, it attracts this little plate here. It's there. And we switch off. Okay. As it switches off, you can see the contact comes through the arc chute and suppresses any arc. RCDs cannot detect a difference, a, a short circuit, I'm sorry. If the same current is going through the line as the neutral, doesn't matter what it's going through or what current it is, this coil will have no magnetism on it. RCDs can only pick up earth faults. That if you, if you have a short circuit, it will sit there and let it happen. But as soon as it gets a 30 milliamp earth fault, bang, it's gone, it's switched off. A circuit breaker protects against overload and protects against overcurrent. An RCD only protects against earth faults. Okay. A circuit breaker protects against all of it, but it's just not quite as good as an RCD at earth faults. So the answer is an RCBO. An RCBO, a residual current, a residual current breaker with overload, is just a combination of a circuit breaker, so you've got a circuit breaker down in this end, and an RCD at this end. Okay, so it just does both. It does, it does everything. If you look here, you'll see similarities with your circuit breaker. You got your solenoid. You got your arc chute, and on this brand of RCBO, your your 
bimetallic strip is over here is this one over here okay works very much the same way as a circuit breaker as you switch it contact is made here as it opens your arc shoots down through the arc chute and down into there you got your pin on your solenoid comes across there okay very similar over on this side you've got your toroidal transformer you've got your neutral coming through here you've got your line coming through as well so they both go through the transformer and this is your little uh, little solenoid over here so if we set that this board hit this solenoid operates under earth fault pulls this little plastic strip a uh, little metal strip in the plastic housing and switches the whole thing off okay so this section works the same as the circuit breaker so overload protection is here overload protection over current protection and this is going to be your earth fault protection so as far as protective measures go this is probably the gold standard it protects against everything and it does it very very well that's it guys thanks for watching see you next time